Hi, and welcome to MC Squared, a podcast which explores current scientific breakthroughs by interviewing the people who made them. On this episode, we talk to Nathan Klein, a PhD student at the University of Washington, who created the most efficient algorithm to date for the traveling salesman problem. Solving this problem would have implications as grand as curing cancer. But before we get to how to solve it, what's the traveling salesman problem in the first place? Yeah, so um, suppose you have just a collection of cities and you know sort of the the distances between each pair of them, say in, in miles or something. Then the traveling salesman problem, or I'll call it TSP, um, is to find the shortest route, which visits every city and then returns to the starting point. Um, and so there's a few like clarifications. And basically, almost all the time when people say TSP, they actually mean so-called metric TSP. Um, so I'll be, I'll be talking about metric TSP the whole time. And, and what this means is that uh, here the distances between the cities obey the triangle inequality. And this says that the distance from city A to like city C is at most the distance from city A to city B plus the distance from city B to city C. And this, this makes a lot of sense, like to the point where it's almost kind of pedantic. Like if I want to travel from city A to city C, obviously I can first go from A to B and then from B to C. So it shouldn't cost more somehow for me to go from A to C. And you can look at TSP without this assumption, but it doesn't really make as much sense in the real world. So it's pretty rare, uh, to not look, to not use this metric assumption, and when you assume it's metric, you actually make the problem a lot easier. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of why we look at metric TSP. Um, and then from here, there are a lot of variations, but um, yeah, I guess I'll just talk about two. So, usually, when you say TSP, uh, you actually mean symmetric TSP, which means that the distance between any two cities is the same in both directions. So going from A to B is the same as going from B to A. Um, Yeah, so again, when people say TSP, they really mean symmetric metric TSP most of the time. But there's also uh, a popular variant called asymmetric TSP, where the distances may be different depending on whether you're going from A to B or or B to A. Um, And this is actually sort of a more uh, faithful model of the real world in a lot of situations. Like if a city is on top of a hill, it's probably faster to go from A to B than it is from B to A, like if, if A is on the hill, say. Um, but yeah, nevertheless, we usually talk about the symmetric version. There's a variant of TSP called the Euclidean TSP, and this is when you just have points on a plane, and the distance between any two cities is given by the distance on that plane. And actually, this problem turns out to be a lot easier. Uh, we can solve this problem like almost exactly. Um, but yeah, so the real hard cases of TSP are when sort of the distances don't really correspond to uh, like these straight line distances on the plane. So think of like having roads, um, you know, they may sort of go, if you're driving from city A to city B, you might not be driving like along the straight line that connects them. You might be driving on different roads and they may have different speeds. And so um, the right way to sort of conceptualize TSP is to think of a graph where all the cities are sort of nodes. And then the edges are the distances between the nodes. And um, the, the edges that aren't there are just the shortest path from those two nodes in that graph. So you can just, yeah, any like collection of nodes and edges can be expanded to a full TSP instance. And that's sort of the right conception. But Euclidean TSP is like also a, a very, very valid question. It's just turns out to actually be pretty solvable. What is an approximation algorithm? And why is this type of algorithm the most effective way to solve a problem like TSP? Yeah, so it it turns out that TSP, like many problems we care about in computer science, is very, very difficult to solve exactly. It's a very difficult computational problem. Um, Well, at least like we think it is. Um, It could could be the case, like someone could come along tomorrow and devise a, a perfect algorithm for it. But as far as we know, that's not really possible. Um, so for now, we assume that it's hard to get precisely the right answer, like the best possible tour. And the best algorithms we have to do that, to get the best tour, run in exponential time. 
So like if you have n cities, it runs in two to the n steps. And this means that for instances with a lot of cities, like a thousand cities or something, we'd have to wait hundreds of years to get exactly the right answer. Uh, or for really big instances, maybe until the heat death of the universe or, or something. But this has been the case for a long time. TSP has been around for a long time. We've never known how to solve it exactly. Um, so instead of just giving up, researchers said, okay, we can't get fast exact algorithms. We can't get exactly the right answer quickly, but maybe we can get fast approximate algorithms. Um, so if you relax this assumption that you have to get the exact right best tour, then maybe we can do something. Um, and the answer here is yes, like we, we can actually do something. And this is, this is also true for a lot of other important problems in computer science. So formally, an approximation algorithm is something that runs quickly, meaning in polynomial time as opposed to exponential time, like say n to the fifth is good, two to the n is bad. Um, and it, this algorithm has to output a solution that's provably close to the best possible solution. So for example, you might be able to find an algorithm for TSP that runs in like n squared time and outputs a solution with cost at most twice that of the optimal. And that'd be pretty good. We would say such a thing as an approximation algorithm with ratio two, because it's at most twice as bad as, as the best thing you could get. Before you and your collaborators came along, what was the most efficient algorithm and how did it work? Yeah, so um, yeah, it turns out TSP was one of the first problems that researchers tried getting approximation algorithms for. Started looking in the, like the 70s for these things. Um, and uh, a researcher named Nikos Christofides found a very famous approximation algorithm in 1976, which is called, we just call it Christofides algorithm, um, or actually Christofides Sergiokov algorithm, because independently, someone in the USSR um, called Anatoly Sergiokov found the same algorithm, like around the same time, and we just didn't know about it for a long time. But anyway, um, so I'll just call it Christofides algorithm. So it has a ratio of 1.5 meaning that it always produces a solution that's at most 50% longer than the optimal one. So if it outputs a solution that's 150 miles long, it's sort of at the same time guaranteeing you that there's no solution shorter than 100 miles. And yeah, so it, it works like this. Um, as I said, you can think of a traveling salesman problem as a graph where the cities are vertices and, and then each edge has weight equal to the distance between the two cities. And then Christofides' algorithm finds this so-called uh, minimum spanning tree of the graph. So a spanning tree is a collection of edges which connects all the nodes of the graph. And uh, a minimal spanning tree is one which has minimal cost. Um, so there's a lot of ways of connecting all of the nodes, but uh, we want to find one that costs that's as cheap as possible. And it turns out this problem is in P, it's very easy actually to find the minimum cost spanning tree. Um, so we can do this part. However, uh, it, this isn't enough because now what we get is sort of some collection of edges and some of the nodes might have odd degree. So they might have like, you might have a, a city which only has one edge coming out of it. And this, this doesn't make sense as a, as a route for the salesman to, to travel. Because once you enter a city, obviously you have to leave it as well, right? So every city in a, in a tour, like if you were to map out anywhere, anyone wherever to go, all of the places they went, the edges would have, you know, they would have even degree in this graph. Um, so every city needs to have even degree. So the algorithm then fixes this problem by adding the so-called uh, minimum cost matching between the odd vertices of the tree. Um, and this is basically adding the minimum cost collection of edges, which will make every odd vertex even. Um, and we call it a matching because we do this basically by uh, pairing up the odd vertices and then adding edges between them. And this we also know how to compute quickly, so this algorithm runs quickly. And, and now you look at the collection of edges you get when you add the matching to the tree. Um, and, and in this collection, like I said, every vertex has even degree now. Um, and it turns out that such a graph 
always has a, a so-called Eulerian tour, which is a tour in which you use every edge exactly once. So we get we get a tour where you visit every edge in this in this new collection we have, uh, where you visit every city at least once. So this is a like a valid solution to our problem. We we achieved the goal. We visited every city at least once, and we returned to where we started. And the length of the solution is equal to the sum of the length of the edges in the spanning tree, uh, and the length of the edges in the matching. What did you guys do differently that allowed you to make a more efficient algorithm? Yeah. So. Basically, it, it turns out that there are situations in which this minimum spanning tree chosen by Christofides' algorithm is, is really bad. Um, so remember that I said that after we, we find the tree, we add the minimum cost matching between the odd vertices. And in some situations, Christofides' algorithm will pick, a, will pick a tree in which every vertex is odd. Um, and this basically makes the second step where we add the matching between the odd vertices really expensive because if every vertex is odd, you have to add a lot of edges. And so basically the, the game is to make find a tree that makes this matching cheaper. Um, and one common tool for TSP is to look at the so-called linear programming relaxation of TSP. Um, and this is a very sort of common phenomenon in, in computer science. So um, if you try to solve problems where you have sort of binary choices, like first I go to city A, then I go to city B, uh, these can be very hard to solve. Like if I have to decide yes or no for sort of a bunch of things, uh, we're, there are a lot of problems which we're very bad at solving. On the other hand, problems where you can make sort of fractional choices, like say, I'll, you know, I'll first, I'll go half to city A and half to city B. These problems turn out to be a lot easier. Um, and what's basically going on um, is like this. So suppose you're in some space, uh, like, you know, in the real world, like standing somewhere, and you're trying to find the tallest mountain. And let's say uh, the tallest mountain corresponds to the best TSP solution. Um, well, if you're in a, a binary world where you have to say sort of yes or no for going to city A or city B, then the sort of space that you're in looks very crazy and spiky. Um, so you might visualize this as like you're standing somewhere and there's like walls all around you, like very close to you and some farther from you and like some hills very close to you. And so um, if you're trying to find the tallest mountain, there's it's really hard to see it because there might be a wall like right in front of your face and you can't look, you can't look past it to see the, the mountain. So it will be really hard to actually know which direction to travel and you might never be able to find this tallest mountain. So that's sort of the issue in binary spaces. Um, and what has been figured out uh, is that fractional spaces where you can sort of make these half choices, like half go to city A, half go to city B, these spaces look very smooth and nice. Um, so when we relax a binary problem into a fractional one, we're basically smoothing out the spikes in this binary space, and we're getting something very clean. So if you stand in a fractional space, you can always see the tallest mountain. You can always sort of see all around you, and you can, you can just see this tallest mountain and just walk, walk straight up to it. So it turns out that if you sort of encode TSP, in this fractional world, you can solve it exactly. Um, yeah, and this is, this is a very common trick in approximation algorithms. Um, and basically, after doing this, you know, you, you have a, a fractional solution, and it doesn't make sense in the real world. So what you then do is you sort of translate it back um, to this binary, messy world that, that we sort of live in. Um, but we hope that sort of visiting this fractional world has given us some information that tells us about where the right solution is. Um, or in this analogy sort of tells us where the tallest mountain is. Um, so yeah, you might imagine that even after smoothing out this fractional space and going to the tallest mountain, back in binary world, maybe it's still close to where the tallest mountain was before we did this smoothing. Um, and so in TSP, this fractional world basically tells us what's the probability we should include an edge in our TSP solution. Um, and the higher the probability, 
basically the more likely that we should put it in our solution. And so, yeah, this is this idea has been around for a long time. And uh, in TSP, researchers basically had tried for many years to use this information to find a good spanning tree. So um, the paradigm is basically you get this fractional solution and then you build a spanning tree such that each edge is included with probability with the probability given by the fractional space. However, there's sort of a, a lot of ways to, to go from this fractional space to a, to a distribution of trees. And it kind of wasn't clear what the right way of doing that was. Um, and so about 10 years ago, my advisor, uh, Cheyenne Obeis garan and uh, two other researchers, Saberi and Singh, had a great idea. Uh, they basically said, let's look at the distribution which corresponds to these fractional world probabilities, uh, but also has maxim maximal entropy. So meaning that the distribution you get is sort of as random as possible, has as much variety in the, in the trees you could get as possible. Um, and then they just considered this algorithm, basically solve the fractional space, uh, find a distribution which maximizes entropy and obeys the law of this fractional space, uh, and then pick a tree from that distribution and then add the minimum cost matching on the odd vertices, just like Christophe days. Um, and this is a great idea and the algorithm sort of seemed good, but uh, it turned out to be really difficult to analyze. Um, so they, when they introduced it, they were able to show that it was good for a certain type of TSP instance called like graphic TSP, which is when um, the distances between cities are given by uh, an unweighted graph. So think of every edge as having value one. Um, so they showed it, it was good for that, but, but then there was sort of no work uh, related to these trees because they were sort of difficult to analyze. Um, and so what uh, Anna Carlin and Cheyenne and I did is basically to look at this algorithm again uh, and tweak it just a little bit and sort of prove that actually it does beat Christophides' algorithm on, on every TSP instance. Um, and to be exact, we, we showed that it produces a tour no more than 1.5 minus 10 to the negative 36 times longer than the optimal one. So we made this like really, really minuscule improvement, but yeah, it was the first one in a long time. So in, in over like 40 years, um, so it's some step in the right direction. What is the difference between the P and NP classes of complexity? And is the traveling salesman problem currently considered a P or NP problem? Sure. So yeah, the, the P class of problems is, is ones that we know can be solved in polynomial time. So we don't know if the traveling salesman problem is in P. Um, and then the NP class is problems whose solutions we can check in polynomial time. So uh, the simplest example of an NP problem that we don't know is in P is the so-called subset sum problem. So if I, if I give you a collection of numbers, say like 1, 5, 10, 20 or something, and, and then I ask you, is there a collection of these numbers which sums to a particular number, uh, say like 25, um, it's very easy to, to check if you've given me the right answer. I just sum up the numbers you've given me, and if it's 25, I say, good job. If it's not, I say, that's not right. Um, However, finding out if there is a correct answer seems to be very difficult. So the problem is in NP, because if you give me a solution, I can check if it's right. Um, but I don't know actually how to produce that solution. Um, so producing a solution is in P. Checking the solution means the problem is in NP. And actually, the traveling salesman problem is not in NP, because you can't check whether a route you get is optimal. If I give you a route and I say, is this the best one? It's not clear how to, how to check that. Um, if you could check it, actually, you'd probably have solved the problem. Um, so a slightly different version of the problem is, is actually an NP, which is like this. It's, um, is there a solution to this TSP problem with length at most 1,000 miles? So this is a valid question I can ask. And now if you give me a tour, I can just see how long it is. And if it's at most 1,000 miles, I say yes. Otherwise, I say, I say no. So this, this sort of decision version of the problem is an NP but not in P, as far as we know. But um, yeah, but I'd say this difference uh, is not too important. Um, basically, if P equals NP, for example, then meaning all problems in NP are also in P, 
then we can still solve TSP quickly. Um, basically, you just keep asking this question, like, is there a solution of cost of most of 1,000? If not, you move to 2,000, you know, and you sort of, you can find the right number by, by doing a kind of binary search. Um, so it, it's technically not an NP, but it's, it's not sort of very important that it's not because this other version, which uh, gives you the right answer, is in NP. If someone proved that P is equal to NP, how would this affect the, the P versus NP debate? It would, yeah, it would resolve it. So if you, if you can solve TSP instances uh, to optimality, you prove that P is equal to NP. Um, yeah, but, but actually, just to throw it in there, most of us, sorry, mo most of computer scientists think that P is not equal to NP. Um, so there's probably more work going on to trying to prove that there is no fast algorithm for TSP than trying to actually find one. Um, but yeah, if you, if you found a, a fast algorithm for TSP that solves it exactly, um, then you, yeah, you sort of turn the, turn our, turn our world on its head. Um, for sure. What would be the implications of solving the traveling salesman problem? outside of the realms of computer science and mathematics? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a fun question. So um, actually, if you're listening and you're interested, you might want to check out uh, Lance Fortno's book called The Golden Ticket. Um, and it, it kind of has a series of, of stories about a world in which someone proves P equals NP. Um, and I think the, the first example he gives is, is actually curing cancer. Um, which is, it's obviously a little bit speculative, but I, th I think it's probably not too much of a stretch. So the logic is that something that's already going on in cancer research is to sort of analyze the subject's DNA and then also analyze the DNA signature of the cancer cells that they have. Um, so if P equals NP, that part will be easier probably. But so now we actually have a, a concrete goal. We want to design a drug that will kill the cells with the cancer signature and not harm all the rest of the cells. And you can probably imagine designing something that will check a drug quickly, like maybe simulating the interaction of the drug with the person's body. Um, and so if P equals NP, then we can say, if there's such a drug, we can just find it very quickly. Um, and then we could produce it and give it, give it to the patient. So yeah, Fortno sort of, it's suggesting that if P equals NP, you could literally cure cancer. Um, and there's, there's a lot of other sort of things. So a scary one is that cryptography uh, becomes really hard. Basically, the security of the internet is based on the idea that P is not equal to NP. Uh, so if you, if you prove that it is, then we have to completely rethink computer security and privacy and, and all that stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, there's some other weird ones. I think in his book, he also talks about uh, sort of automating art. So suppose, you know, after harvesting everyone's data, like Spotify could figure out, could find an algorithm that would basically say if a certain person would like a song or not, sort of before they listen to it. Um, then P equals NP would imply that there is an algorithm which can actually create a song that that person would like, and maybe the, the best song for that person or something like that. Um, and the same could maybe go for visual art or, or so on. Um, I mean, this one's also pretty speculative because it's unclear like whether you could actually write an algorithm that would be able to tell if you liked a song or not. Uh, so it depends sort of what you believe about humans maybe, um, but at least that's sort of, I think sort of reasonable. Um, and then I think, uh, yeah, similarly, all kinds of machine learning tasks become like basically trivial. Um, so machine learning is, is full of problems of the form, like find me a description of the data that best predicts the future, for example, or best predicts something. Um, and at the moment, this is kind of like an art uh, designing the right model. But uh, if P equals NP, we just ask this algorithm, actually, what is the best description of the data for predicting the future? And it'll just, it'll just do that. Um, so basically every application of machine learning would become uh, many orders of magnitude better, like self-driving cars, weather prediction, machine translation, um, yeah, and so on. So yeah, basically 
showing P equals NP would, would change a lot of things about our world. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people think that they're not equal. Um, and so that's why for TSP and a lot of other problems, we sort of focus on getting these approximate answers. That concludes this episode of MC Squared. Huge thanks to Dr. Klein for agreeing to be on the podcast. If you like this, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.